the 60s, we know that there are four besides the protons, neutrons, hadrons, etc. And that they are confined. And since then, it was considered how could we uh, treat hadronic matter in such a way that uh, quarks could be released from this confinement. There has been a lot of theoretical work which predicted the experimental signatures for this deconfinement. And uh, since 1994, on the basis of all this theoretical work and a broad experimental program was launched at CERN. It was broad because of the diversity of the signatures which were expected and the difficulty of addressing all of that in a single experiment. And that we owe to the scientific community uh, a broad, detailed, educated, I would say, information on the results obtained. Uh, it is also appropriate because, as you know, uh, tools with even higher potential than those available at the SPS will be soon underway to, to proceed further in the study of deconfinement of quarks. So it appeared to all of us that it was an appropriate time to make an assessment and to try to put together all the information received. This is the goal of this morning, uh, for which you, you have seen the program. And uh, I will uh, call immediately on Ulrich Heinz, who will talk about making quark gluon matter in relativistic nuclear collisions. So, the big question is, of course, what happened in between? What happened when this is while the system was going from the initial high energy density to the final low energy density, and in particular, what can we learn about the behavior of matter in the very dense initial stages? At this point, I would like to summarize uh, a few of the key predictions that were made before this experimental program started. Um, about how a quark gluon plasma should manifest itself in the data. The first of these predictions is the prediction of strangeness enhancement and the approach to chemical equilibrium between up-down and strange quarks in heavy ion collisions. And the mechanism for that is supposed to be a shorter time scale for the production of strange quarks and strange anti-quark pairs by gluon fusion. And this is a direct consequence of the gluon deconfinement in the quark gluon plasma, which leads to high gluon densities, and chiral symmetry restoration, which makes the mass threshold for the strange quarks in the final state small. There is, of course, a hadronic background that one can conceive here, which is the normal production of strangeness through associated production followed subsequently by strangeness exchange. However, it was shown by uh, detailed calculations and simulations that particles which contain more than one unit of strangeness and which are typically very heavy, hadrons which contain more than one unit of strangeness and are typically very heavy, in particular when they are antibaryons with more than one unit of strangeness, that th their production is inhibited by the low antibaryon densities and high mass thresholds and the corresponding equation times are just very, very long. It has been shown by simulations and uh, by rate calculations, that there is no time in, in, in during the short time of the collision that the hadrons could, re could establish such a kind of chemical equilibrium by hadronic inelastic scattering. So this implies that this apparent chemical equilibrium must have been pre-established at the point of hadron formation. Um, it's not a hadronic hadronic rescattering equilibrium, it's some kind of pre-established equilibrium, and the, uh, the, the simplest and I think most consistent interpretation of this is that you have reached the state by a statistical process by which the hadrons appear from uh, other degrees of freedom from the quark and gluon degrees of freedom by a statistical hadronization process. The second key observation is that this chemical, apparent chemical equilibrium comes along with uh, enhancement of strangeness overall. There, uh, if one calculates the, from the final state the fraction of produced strange anti-strange quark pairs compared to the produced light quark anti-quark pairs, this ratio is uh, 
different by a factor of two from uh, elementary particle collisions, proton-proton, electron-positron, proton-antiproton collisions. And uh, this indicates that there must be a new type of rapid strangeness producing uh, processes which are active before the hadronization, before the hadron production occurs or during the hadronization process itself. Now, when you look at how this enhanced strangeness is, is distributed among the strangeness carrying, barrier, uh, strangeness carrying particles in the final state, you find a very striking behavior, namely that those particles which contain several units of strangeness profit from this enhancement much more strongly than particles which have only one unit of strangeness. This again supports the interpretation that this is a statistical process which just redistributes the available strangeness according to statistical laws. And none of these three observations can be explained uh, by hadronic final state interactions. In particular, you cannot understand why particles which are very, very heavy and suppressed by has, high, high mass thresholds should be enhanced by a factor of 15, while other particles which are light uh, are enhanced only by a factor of 2. Here yeah, now the third presentation of the experimental results by Reinhard Stock which is entitled Hadron Signals from the Little Bank. Right now. So next I will talk about bulk hadronic production and what we learned from it as far as the phase transition is concerned. The task now is to, is to measure the systematics of hadron production from pi via k to lambda, omega, xi, etc., etc. And you do this as a function of collision centrality from peripheral collisions where the number of participating nucleons is small to head on where you have about uh, 400 because you bombard 208 mass nuclei. And you see here, for example, the total k on yield in relation to the pi on yield. And you see the, the phenomenon which one usually calls strangeness enhancement by about a factor of two from the proton-proton level to the central lead, lead level, there is a good factor of two of enhancement of strangeness production. Most of the strangeness that's produced goes into chaos, actually. And we will see other aspects of strangeness production later on. Just to compare to data from a different experiment, you see in the two plots here of NA52, similarly as a number of participant protons or centrality the k on production ratio increases smoothly and settles near the central collisions. NA52 is shown also as an example that you do not only measure kaons, k minus production in rapidity space, but antiprotons. And that particular experiment goes on to measure antideutrons and obtain an estimate for anti helium 3 production. There's no more question. I will ask Emanuele Kwerschik to take the floor and take the mic. Emanuele will speak on strange signals of a new state of matter from nuclear collisions at CERN. Uh, first of all, thank you, Ranat, for having mentioned Agedon in this uh, occasion and think was due. Then, coming to my talk, I have two small changes to the title. First of all, is strange baryon signals. And the second, I am also ENFN Padova now, OK? I shall talk uh, on behalf of the W97 and NA57 collaboration. And my talk will go through quickly motivation, experiment, results, and conclusion. Now, let me first start uh, quoting the laboratories. Since there are two experiments, there is a, a large overlap between them, but there are some laboratories who are only in one, and they should be mentioned. Physics motivation starts from a suggestion of 20 years ago that if a QGP state is formed, one expect that the strange quark go in equilibration in a few Fermi over C, and this would lead to an announcement of S quark versus UD with respect to normal hadronic interaction. The basic mechanism have already been mentioned by Uli, gluon abundance, partial restoration of chiral symmetry, and Pauli blocking 
of UED Quark, which at SPS Energy is especially. Another consequence is of this uh, scenario is that hyperon abundances would be frozen at the critical temperature since the hadronic reactions are too slow to compete with the rapid expansion of the fireball. This uh, suggestion leads to two quantitative predictions. One is that uh, out of the, in the final state, strange and anti-strange baryon and antibaryon will come close to hadronic thermal and chemical equilibrium. And this would lead to enhanced formation of strange and multi-strange uh, baryons and antibaryons. The second is that in the hyperon transverse momentum spectra, uh, one expects to see expansion flow effects of this uh, expansion of the fiber. Now, all this has been already said. Why we look, why we concentrate, we spend a lot of time to extract the multiple strange baryons, it has the Xi and the Omega. This, their study is crucial because in the QGP scenario, like in any statistical hadronization scenario, their abundance, their enhancement is expected to increase with its strangeness content. This is, therefore, one, in this scenario, one the expect that omega more enhanced than psi, more enhanced than lambda, with respect to normal hadronic interaction. And such a pattern contradicts the expectation from rescattering in the hadronic fireball, since multi-strange particle formation is hindered by high threshold and low cross-section. Let me be uh, more specific. In the, if, in a, if there is no quark plasma, you have a fireball uh, full of hadrons which rescatter violently, it uh, would be easy to form a lambda and chaos, but much more difficult to produce multi-strange baryons, and especially antibaryons. If we make the example of the omega, anti-omega, for instance, Either we produce it by direct interaction, and then you have a threshold of 3 GV, or you have to go through a series of interactions. You produce once an antinucleon, and then a kaon, and so, and so, and so. And uh, in the end, you will have an anti-omega, but that will take a long time. So, of, I mean, one can, the calculation depends, but uh, is of the order of 100 Fermi for multi-strange antibiron, so longer than the old time involved in the process. So we come to the W97 and A57 experiment. You can find the information in the, on the web. We made a special effort to update our page. So W97 looks for collision lead-lead, proton-lead and proton-beryllium at 150 G8 158 GV per nucleon, B momentum. And we study the production of lambda, xi, and omega baryons and antibaryons. It has the baryons which carry one, two, three units of strangeness. And we also look for K0 short and positive and negative particle. Negative particles are more interesting since they are mainly pions. There are no protons inside, no antiprotons, very few antiprotons. But anyhow, we concentrate on this lambda psi omega. In a phase space window, which is, uh, spans about one unit around uh, the center of mass rapidity, and uh, Pt larger than a few hundred MeV over C. The centrality of the collision range, uh, measured by the number of wounded nucleons, this means the nucleon that interact at least, at least once Ah, the number, uh, which can be called the number of participants, between 100 and 416. 100 would correspond to an impact parameter of about 8 Fermi. So this is W97. NA57 is its follow-up, is in progress. Has the same aim as W97, but on a larger centrality range, in order to see if there are centrality effect, thresholds or something, and also uses, has been already taking data with different beam energies, and we are very eager to look at their results. So I will talk about W97, 
The setup was in the late omega magnet. This is the beam, a target, some multiplicity counters that we use to extract the number of wounded nucleons via Glauber model. And the heart of our detector is this five times five centimeter cross-section silicon telescope which, however, contains half a million channels. And uh, the whole thing, of course, is embedded in the omega magnetic field, 1.8 Tesla. And here we have some liver arm chamber uh, to improve the precision on fast tracks. Now, to have an idea of the quality of, uh, of this uh, pixel detector, five times five centimeter, because we switched off the magnetic field, otherwise nobody could <laughs> recognize any track. And then you can see 150 T track reconstructed in a five times five detector. So where am I left? Good, so at that point we concentrate on this decay, the decay of Xi in lambda pi, and the K of omega in lambda K, and the lambda in proton pi minus. Having done that, we move to yields, so number of particles per, per uh, event. And uh, we divide our particle into groups. Group of particles which don't have any quark in common with the target projectile nucleons, and uh, particle which have some. We have some doubts about the K0, but we put it that because there were doubts. Uh, the reason why is that is empirical is, no, is known, saying then in proton beryllium, proton lead, there are differences between uh, the rapidity distribution. Okay. So this is on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, we put the number of participants determined, as I mentioned before. So here is proton beryllium, proton lead, and lead lead divided in four centrality classes, as I have said before. Now, that's fine. Uh, we, of course, this has been corrected by acceptance efficiency. We have done a lot of uh, uh, checks. We have found that uh, we get uh, the, the table value for the omega lifetime, for the xi lifetime, so there has been, as usual, as all of us, a lot, of, a lot behind. There is a lot of experimental work which today is not uh, mentioned. So at this point, we had two questions. The first question was, are these hyperon yields in lead-lead consistent with thermal and chemical equilibrium? The second question was, how does behave the pattern, how is the pattern of hyperon enhancement when I go from proton beryllium to proton lead. So let's go and look at the enhancements. So the enhancements, I mean, to, to see the enhancement, uh, we, we put to one the proton beryllium yields for all kind of particles. Okay, so we have moved to one just to see the, we want to see the enhancement, therefore we have to choose a pivot. So we take there, if uh, the yields were increasing according to the number of participants, they would follow this line, okay? Uh, here also, I must repeat, uh, is kept the separation between the particles which don't have quark in common and particles which have quark in common with the incoming nucleons. So as you can see here, the negatives are slightly enhanced, the lambda are more, and the xi are even more. The same is here in this group of particles. The anti-landas are little enhanced, the anti-xi are more, and the omega even more. Another way of seeing it is to do the yield per participant. Divide this by the horizontal thing, which is uh, equivalent. And here it is. As you can see, proton beryllium and proton lead are consistent, and the enhancement are more or less equal in our centrality range. This means uh, uh, impact parameters smaller than something like eight Fermi. Uh, now, since they are similar, I, can, I am allowed to take average values. 
So I take our values and then I plot the enhancements. And this is the enhancement. For negatives, near to 1, the lambda, near to 2, and the xi, higher, near to whatever, 7, 6. And for, the, for this particle, which have nothing to do with, no quark in common, with, uh, you have uh, the anti-lambda, anti-xi, anti-omega. Omega, anti-omega, here are together. You may wonder why, what happened to the anti-omega. Okay, the statistics, of course, decreases, but here are the omega and the anti-omega separately. So cl we clearly see a hierarchy of enhancement. Good. So at this moment, I think uh, I am ready to go to the conclusions. Hyperon yields, we confirm quantitatively the chemical equilibrium in all measures, strange baryon and antibaryon abundances, which was a QCB prediction. We find that the enhancement going from proton beryllium to that lead increases with the strangeness of the particle. And for the omega is the relatively large number of 15. Now, we want to stress that for multi-strange baryon, no hadronic microscopic model has predicted a strangeness enhancement leading to chemical equilibration. Now, addition of ad hoc new effects, we have looked several of them, made somewhere the thing better for the XI, but uh, none of them has been successful in reproducing the omega enhancement. However, one criticism uh, against this new ad hoc effect is, old as, is called the Occam razor. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> now, uh, I have still a final conclusion, which is the following, that our pieces of the QGP jigsaw fit. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Emmanuel, for, for your talk. Uh, turning strange signals into a clear signal. Uh, we'll go into the last talk. Uh, the summary by the DG, Luciano, please. So that's going to be a very short summary. Uh, but uh, let me start it by saying that uh, I consider really a privilege to have been able to listen to such a clear presentation of results which have been accumulating during these years. And indeed, it's a very exciting summary of a very successful program. Uh, it was believed since many years that at very high temperatures and density, uh, nuclear matter would undergo a phase transition. And uh, uh, let me show you my understanding of that. Again, now temperature goes in this way. What we learn is that in these collisions, there is a sort of last scattering surface, the place where, uh, well, uh, really hadrons freeze out, and that is expanding at a remarkable velocity. It's uh, half the velocity of light, and from various combinations of interferometry, energy, etc., we can uh, fix the temperature. Uh, a rather low temperature on our scale. It's under 20 MeV. More inside, at about a temperature of under 70 MeV, we have seen this very interesting and, uh, and the clear signal of uh, the formation of strange particles. Uh, we hope out of an equilibrium where uh, strange quarks were more abundant than normally. In fact, that's the... Uh, most impressive result of today's discussion when you put everything together. Although some bit and piece can be explained in alternative ways, my feeling is that, in fact, we are seeing a new picture. So this concludes this uh, special uh, scientific seminar. Uh, I think we can uh, thank all the other speakers this morning for uh, a consistent, broad 
uh, presentation of all what has been accomplished and all the results obtained, which provide a very consistent picture indeed. Thank you very much.